Hey, aloha no kako. This is Kenton Kuba again coming to you from the island of Maui in the Pacific Ocean. We're going to continue our study on the Olivet Discourse, but first of all, I'd like to again invite you to come to my website at BibleStudyCD.com. Okay, BibleStudyCD.com, the ministry is the discipleship ministry. I've put uh, materials that I've developed on this website. You can download them for free. They're in PDF format, so you can send them to people over the internet through emails. So come and visit and, and download and look at them and perhaps you can use them in your ministry. Uh, many, many people are throughout the world are using them to disciple people for Christ. Okay, let's go to the uh, our scriptures that we're studying in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, and Revelation 6. Uh, we've started our study and we we are where we are is uh, and Jesus is with his disciples. They're on the Mount of Olives. They're overlooking the city of Jerusalem where they can see the temple, where Jesus has told them that, that the, the temple will be destroyed, not one stone will be laid upon another. And when they got to the Mount of Olives, the disciples, or more specifically Peter, James, John, and Andrew, came to him in private and asked him, when will this be? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? And so Jesus begins to explain to them the signs that they should be looking for so that they can know when the temple will be destroyed and when his coming will be as well. And so last time we studied the uh, first sign, which was the coming of the white horse, which was the uh, false Christ. And Jesus says, be, be careful because many will come in my name, in fact, claiming to be me and, and to mislead many. And so he tells them, do not be misled. And so that was the first sign. That was the uppermost thing in his heart. But we're going to continue on and we're going to see that there are other signs. And uh, like I said last time, uh, it, it can become very depressing, really. As I, and I, as I've done this study, uh, it, it, is, it is dark and it's very depressing. Uh, like the Lord of the Rings, I, I said, um, it, you just go through this very dark time uh, where they had to endure and finally at the very end, the return of the king he returns and sets everything straight and that's our great hope and that is what we are, we keep our eyes upon because jesus is coming and uh, he's going to bring uh, justice and righteousness and we are finally going to be satisfied because that is what we long for so as we begin our study let's begin with the word of prayer as always let's pray my friend oh lord we just pray that you would bless our time father bless our time with you and we pray that we would bless your name, that we would bless you by hearing your voice, by hearing your voice in your word, and putting it into practice, and putting it into our hearts, that we might be uh, your servants, looking forward to your return, and working faithfully until you do return. I pray for my friend and myself, Lord, that you would fill us with your, with your spirit right now, that you would fill our hearts and our minds and our eyes that we might see your truth and appreciate it and put it into practice in Jesus name. Amen and amen. And I want to thank you my friend for taking time out from your busy life to join with me and I hope it's a, it's going to be a profitable time uh, for you. Well let's take a look. We're going to continue on in the study and Jesus is still speaking, teaching his disciples and he's going to talk to them about um, what to the next thing to look for and that is he says you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars okay wars and rumors of wars so let me hi highlight that um, let's see if I can do that here he says that here and he says that in in Luke he says wars and disturbances of course this thing is all highlighted but uh, he, you can see it right here he hears of wars and rumors of wars and the thing that he says about it is very interesting. He says in Matthew, See that you are not frightened. And in fact, he repeats it here. Do not be terrified. And in Mark, do not be frightened. And which is uh, the opposite of what people normally would be thinking. As they see their world begin to be uh, covered and saturated with wars and rumors of wars, it would be natural to be frightened. But Jesus says, see that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. And that is not yet the end. But that is not yet the end. And so, you know, when, when was this thing fulfilled? Well, 
it's been being fulfilled for the last 2,000 years at least since Jesus said these words. There has been continuous war from the time Jesus said this. And so it is being fulfilled and we are still seeing wars uh, in our world today. In fact, let me um, take you to this, this website right here. And this one here lists the number of wars that are actually going on today. And you can see right here the current wars, the countries, and who are the combatants here in a way. And you can even see here on this side the, the year that it started and it's still continuing. And then it has other conflicts in these other countries. Uh, just look at the number of these things that's going on. Just a, a bunch of them that's a war is going on on our planet right right even now. So Jesus' prophecy is was fulfilled and is being fulfilled and as we are probably and can believe that it's still going to be fulfilled in the future, wars will still be happening till the very end, as he says. And then he says in verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and that's what we can look forward to. And this is something that, this is a passage right here that many people are familiar with. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. This word nation it comes is is where our word ethnic or eth, eth, ethnic people come from ethnic, where it is a tribe or is it is a group of people, um, like a tribe, a family of people, and uh, so it's not necessarily an entire country fighting another country. It can be a language group fighting another language group. In Papua New Guinea, we might have Highlanders fighting coastal people, but more often it would be one village against another village. I know in Africa, within a one country, you can have language groups fighting against each other. Uh, and uh, like in, in Papua New Guinea, I was driving one time. I had gone way out into the um, uh, the boonies, I guess you would say, in the Baya River area, where they, they they had a Baptist mission, and I was sharing with them some of my materials with them. And on the way back to uh, Mount Hagen, uh, I stopped on the road because there were just a bunch of cars uh, stopped on the road. The drivers were all outside and they're all looking towards the jungle and I thought well, what's going on? You know the road was high up and you could look down into the jungle. So I stopped and I got out of my car and I, and I went to, to the guy that's standing there. I said what's, what are you guys looking at? And he said uh, way over there can't you see it? There's a tribal tribal warfare going on. Tribal fight. And I looked way out there about 200 yards and I could see it. And then finally I could see smoke coming up from the village where they had the grass huts because uh, the invading uh, tribe was setting fire to their grass huts. And then I could hear these, these thudding noise and they're like, doom, 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 doom. And I thought, what, what is that? And so I asked the Papua New Guinea guy next to me, I said, what, what, what's that noise? And he said, it's the arrows hitting the shields. And as I looked, it's like the movies. You, you've seen these movies where you have these uh, invading armies and they all shoot their arrows off, flying through the air. And, and as I looked, I could see, you know, the arrows flying through the air from one, one side all the way hitting the people in the village on the other side. And I could see that the men in the village had put up their uh, big wooden shoes. I mean, these were huge six foot high shoes that covered their entire bodies head to toe. And the arrows were hitting these things. And behind the men, I could see the uh, women and children just running out. And I could hear them screaming as they ran out of the village on the uh, the other side. The men were playing like a rear guard action for their women and children. And as these other guys came charging in with their axes, and now just like in the movie, they're going to clash and they're going to fight each other with uh, axes and machete. Uh, at the time that I was in Papua New Guinea, they didn't use guns. That was looked down upon. They used the traditional weapons of arrows and axes. And so as I saw that, I, you know, I thought, wow, it's incredible that in the 20th century, I'm looking at a tribal fight. But it's the same thing as right here. Nation rising against nation. Ethnic group against ethnic group. Language group against language group. One race against another race. Kingdom against kingdom. And that's what's happening. So when we go to the book of Revelation, uh, the, the second horse that is released uh, when Jesus breaks the second seal is actually talking about this very thing. And so this is what we read there. When Jesus, he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature. And, and who's this living creature? Well, if you read um, the context, you discover that it's actually a seraphim, an angel. 
an angel with six wings, the same kind of seraphim we saw in Isaiah chapter 6, calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Uh, and th This is the living creature that says to um, John, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. Previously it was a white horse, with the false Christ riding that white horse. Now a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. And you see here in this description that the rider of the red horse comes upon the earth, and he brings war with him. He takes peace from the earth, men would slay one another, a great sword representing war was given to him. Now what I want us to look at is, is uh, are these two words. It was granted to, to take peace from the earth, and a great sword was given to him. Okay. Oh, I, I highlighted the whole thing, but that's okay. Now, who granted uh, this authority to him to take peace from the earth? Who granted him this power, and who gave him this great sword? What do you think? Who do you think gave him this? Do you think it was the devil? Okay. Look, look again at uh, what's happening here. Jesus has the scroll, and he breaks the second seal. So Jesus breaks the seal that releases the red horse. Well, where, where did he get this scroll again? If you read the context in chapter 5 of Revelation, the scroll is actually held by the one who sat on the throne. And of course, that is none other than God himself, the sovereign God who is in control of the entire universe. It was his scroll that he gives to the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who is slain, Jesus himself. And Jesus takes the scroll and he is the only one worthy to open the seals. So the first seal he opens, he releases the false Christ. And the second seal he, he opens, he releases the uh, red horse. The rider is granted uh, to take peace from the earth. Granted by whom? Is it Satan? It doesn't say Satan at all in here. You know who I, you know who I believe it is? Granted by God to take peace from the earth. And this great sword was given to him by God because God is the one who owns that scroll and he's the one who put these seals and Jesus the Son of God opens the seal and releases these forces upon the earth. What, 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 what's happening here? I mean, why, why is this happening? You know, we are very used to seeing God as almost like a Santa Claus that He only gives nice things and good things and we cannot fathom that He will do something like this. And that's why we normally would think this must be the Satan or the Antichrist, you know, doing this. But what I want you to see here is that God is sovereign. He's in complete control. He's in, even in control of the Antichrist. The Antichrist cannot do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. In fact, if you read the book of Job, you remember that Satan had to come to, to God to ask him you know, what, how much uh, persecution and how much pain could he inflict upon Job and, and upon his life. And God would restrict Satan and he would restrict how much he could hurt Job. So you see, God is in control. And you might be asking, you know, why, why would God do something like this? Well, it's because the world is, is um, a world of sinful men, sinful women. And this is God's way of, you know, He's basically in, um, showing His, his uh, holiness, His righteousness against sin, and His anger and His wrath against sin. This is, this is not really the wrath of God. That's coming later when the angels blow the trumpets and pour out the bows. These are just tribulations, as we're going to see. They're not the wrath of God yet, and as we're going to see from the final, um, when the final seal is broken. But these are just tribulations. This is small kind stuff, as we would say in Hawaii, you know, in Pigeon. Uh, it's not even the big things that's going to come upon the world. But I believe God is doing this to turn men's hearts to Him. Because, as you can know, maybe in your own life, maybe you see it in other people's lives, when, they're, when the, a person's life is good, when everything is flowing right, when there's no trials and tribulations, are they going to turn to Him? To turn to God? No, they don't turn to Him. 
It's only when, I don't, I don't know why, you know, we don't turn to God sooner, but it's almost as if we have to reach the bottom of the barrel. When finally we're way down there, finally we look up and we say, Lord, help me. Okay? But otherwise, we try in our own effort to try to make our life better. The last thing we want to do, it seems, is to turn to God, as we're going to see even uh, later on of, of, of people. Uh, on earth, even though they're going through these tribulations, they don't turn to God. Okay, but um, God is doing this so that people do turn to Him. You know, you know, one of the ways to turn people in a certain way is through uh, negative reinforcement, as uh, you learn in uh, psychology class, B.F. Skinner. Okay? But so this is negative reinforcement. It's it's causing somebody to do something positive by negative reinforcement, okay? or as we, we might say, punishment. And so these are like the punishments of God upon a sinful race to try to turn them and to turn them to himself to receive his his love and his mercy so he's in control you see that again in this word he he grants this power to take peace from the earth he gives this great sword to him who, who is riding on the red horse I want us to see that that God is sovereign and as we go through these things he's totally in control so the first horse was spiritual turmoil this horse brings political turmoil upon the world, and it's going to get worse. We've seen the First World War. We've seen the Second World War. We've seen the Korean War. We've seen the Vietnam War. Now we've, we're seeing uh, wars in the Middle East. But this, this war that's coming upon us that we're going to see is the Third World War. It's going to be huge, and uh, it is going to really be something. And, um, you know, and, and we, we need to pray that people turn to God because of the afflictions of these wars. Well, let's move on to the, the next one. This In this seal, there are no gospel equivalents. So I don't have anything, any scriptures from the gospel. So we go straight to the book of Revelation as, he, as Jesus breaks the third seal. And this is what we read. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse this time. Okay. A black horse. We had the white horse, the red horse, now a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. You've probably seen the kind of scales with a bar on the top coming off of a perpendicular piece. And then there are two um, uh, pans on, on the ends of these things so that you can put a weight on this side and you can measure whatever you're measuring on this side. Uh, whether it's vegetables or any any produce or even like gold, somebody is once uh, finds gold nuggets and they'll put the nuggets here and then they'll put the weights here and they can know how much the, the nuggets weigh. So that's what this person is holding in his hands. And th these are the symbols of economics, of financial systems. So he's, he who sat on it had, had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay, what is this? What are we talking about right here? You know, what 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 does this thing mean right here? Okay, it says that the voice that comes out from the four living creatures, and these four living creatures again have six wings, and they are actually hovering around the throne of God, and they're the seraphim that guards God's holiness. And then a voice from the midst of them says, A quart of wheat for a denarius. First of all, what is a denarius? A denarius is a Roman coin. It was their silver coin. The Romans had four different coins. They had uh, the first one here, I have a picture of it here, was the aureus, which was a gold coin. And you have different ones right here. And then you had the denarius, which was a silver coin. And originally the equivalent was one aureus, one gold coin, was equivalent to 25 of these denarii, these silver coins. And then below the silver coin, you had, you had brass coins, and then you had copper coins. And I forget the names of those coins. Okay, but um, it was their system of coinage. But this coin right here, the denarius, was equivalent to one to three days wage. That's what one of these was equivalent to. So you go to work and you get paid, you will be paid one of these, either for one day's work, two days work, maybe even up to three days work, depending upon 
how much you were getting paid. So like today we have uh, different pay scales. Uh, you might be making some really good paying jobs, might be paying you $50 an hour. And then there is what they've de decided was a minimum wage, which I think is around 7 or $8 an hour right now. Well, we, we need to understand how much this thing is worth. So what I have here is one denarius. And uh, what, we, what it's equal to is, is one day's wage. Okay. Now, what is that equal to today? One day's wage. Let's, let's just take a hypothetical. I mean, of course, you could pick any day's wage, you know, because people get paid different amounts. I'm going to pick a person that's uh, maybe about $15 an hour. He earns about $15 an hour. Not minimum, but not the most either. A person that earns $15 an hour will earn in the U.S. dollars $120 per day. Okay, isn't that correct? So one denarius in our money would be $120 in, in that one day of work. Or it, it could be more because if you're if you're getting paid for three days, then this number you'd have to times by three. It's three hundred and sixty dollars that one denarius is worth. Worth, but let's just work with one day for now, just to see what's happening. Well, this the voice says a quart of wheat for one denarius. Well, a quart of wheat for one hundred and twenty dollars—that's a lot of money to pay for one quart of wheat. Well, what 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 can you do with a quart of wheat? I have a um, bread making machine. And so I looked at my recipes that when I make bread, and I'm talking about a regular uh, two-pound loaf of bread, and I noticed that in the recipes, they all required one quart of wheat to make the bread, whether it's whole wheat or whether it's white fl flour, but it required one quart. So I thought this was really interesting that this quart of wheat equals one loaf of bread. So for $120, you could buy one loaf of bread. Well, so we're going to put here one loaf. What does one loaf of bread cost today? I asked my wife that because uh, we, we tend to buy it at, a, you know, at Costco where you can buy two loaves. But if, you had to, if I just went to a regular store, how much would it cost? And she said it's going to cost about $1.50. 